Hey everyone, Michael Short here. Come on, let's go outdoors. Well, you may recall last fall, I spent some time down in uh, Southern Alberta with uh, biologist Joel Nicholson. He's a senior wildlife biologist with Alberta Environment and Protected Areas. And we were talking about sage grouse. Well, we have a follow-up to all of that uh, great work that we managed to film last fall. Uh, this spring, uh, Joel and a number of other biologists were out on the landscape releasing sage grouse coming up from Montana. Joel, first of all, Thanks so much for giving us a little bit of your time. Yeah, you bet. Happy to do so. So let's talk about the release. Um, how many birds uh, did you bring up and, and get out onto the Alberta landscape? So this was quite a big project with a lot of staff involved, a lot of moving parts, and really have to give credit to everybody uh, who was involved. But we went down to uh, northern Montana, and we actually uh, went into an area where they have very uh, healthy, robust sage grouse populations. And we worked with their agency, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And uh, we were able to bring 39 sage grouse hands up and successfully release them uh, in Alberta. So our, our, our target was 40. Um, we managed to capture 39 and uh, we're very happy with that. We did get rained out the first two nights, so we didn't know if we were going to be successful. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, permitting and issues going through the border, so we're only able to capture uh, on the nights when a veterinarian will be at the border crossing in the morning from uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, vet. So that limits us to capturing Sunday through uh, Thursday and the first Sunday, Monday nights, we actually got rained out. And so um, staff managed to catch uh, 20 birds the uh, first two nights. And then the last night we had a big night and uh, managed to catch the uh, the other 19 birds to, to come up to uh, Alberta. So uh, we kind of uh, pulled it out of the fire last minute. Um, we have, uh, crews that actually uh, capture birds. Then we have a crew which which I'm on, which which I lead uh, to put transmitters on the birds. And then we have transport teams in Montana and Alberta uh, to get the birds through the border. And then another team to release the birds um, in southeast Alberta uh, in the Many Berries area. So, like I said, lots of moving parts, lots of people uh, leading different aspects of the program and uh, really, really uh, a project that we're, I think, uh, pretty proud of at this point. We're really hoping to see some positive results with this batch of birds. You've raised so many, so many awesome points. We're going to come circle around and 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 come back to, to some of them. But I do want to ask you... Um, what is the difference? You say that Montana has such a healthy population. You know, I mean, you drive through Montana and, and Southern Alberta and you, you know, apart from going through a checkpoint, you really don't notice significant differences in the landscape. So why do they have big numbers and we don't? Um, they do have bigger pieces of intact habitat with lower levels of development in there. So in the areas where we're capturing uh, birds from in Montana, they're typically large blocks of federal and state owned land. And it's basically native grassland, sagebrush, as far as the eye can see. And there's very little in the way of uh, oil and gas development or other structures um, in those big blocks of land. So it's still, you know, largely intact. And so we're, we're sort of trying to turn the clock back in Alberta with a lot of the work that we, that we showed you in the previous video with oil and gas reclamation and habitat restoration and, uh, and those types of projects. So you're, you're 39 this season. What does that bring to the best of your knowledge, uh, the total number uh, now on Alberta land? So when we did our LEC surveys, which is going to the dancing grounds and counting the males there this spring, we actually were up a couple of birds in Alberta. So, you know, we'll take that as a win. Anything that's not a decline is uh, 
you know makes makes us fairly happy um so we're we're in that neighborhood still a 50 to 60 sage grouse in alberta and so then we've added um 39 hens to that total now of course these birds are very stressed out when we bring them and and they're not uh familiar with the landscape so they make some pretty big movements at times some of them do settle down and nest some of them end up uh you know becoming food for predators which uh you know it's just inevitable when you do projects like this that uh not all of them are going to survive um there's lots of things on the landscape that uh, that like to eat uh grouse and uh we're, we're monitoring them though daily to uh, look at their movements and determine their fate. And then we will follow up any birds that nest and hatch out nests. We'll determine how many of their young survive and go right through their life cycle. And then we will continue to follow them in subsequent years as long as our uh, transmitters last on them. So the type of transmitter that we use is uh pretty interesting technology. I've actually got one here I'll, uh, I'll hold up to the camera. But uh, this is a, uh, a GPS solar powered unit. And those straps actually go around the bird's legs and this sits on the rump. So the sage grouse will be walking along with these antennas sort of sticking up. And the this antenna uh, sends data to satellites and then this is a traditional VHF antenna that we can track the bird using uh, traditional telemetry. But uh, this unit actually um, goes up to the, uh, sends data to the satellites and it gets emailed to us. And so without ever leaving the office, we actually get four GPS locations on these birds every day. And then we can process that data um, with uh, some software and it generates uh, files that we can look at the birds on Google Earth and see exactly where they are each day. We actually have one bird with one of these transmitters on it still from the, the translocation in 2016. So these transmitters will typically last, you know, two to three years if the bird survives, but sometimes longer. And so this one's actually our record where uh, I think we're uh, on eight years tracking one individual bird and if only all of them would survive that well um, <laughs> that would that would make our life easier but uh, we are still getting data from that individual bird so hopefully she survives uh, another year or two and we can set a record for the longest sage grouse ever tracked it, it, it is a remarkable thing almost like the mars rover right <laughs> it just keeps on keeps on going joel let me ask you what's the tipping point in terms of the number of birds okay 50 birds that are up here and and for argument's sake they 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 all can lay eggs successfully and those chicks can grow up and reproduce themselves at what point could you say hey montana thanks so much but we're good to go you know i i think that actually if if we can see uh some type of sustained positive trend in the population so um you know, historically, if you look at our sage grouse data, population went up, the population went down, but it recovered, you know, and, and that's normal for upland birds. You have a positive year with, uh, you know, well-timed rains and good cover conditions. Um, they will have a significant jump in their population. And then maybe you have, you know, a, a prolonged uh, dry period and, uh poor cover conditions and, and rains that happen during the time when the broods are coming off and, and you may have very poor productivity. And that's all normal. But what we've seen with our population is just a continuous decline with the odd little um, increase in there. Like this year, you know, we went up by, you know, 10, 15 percent, whatever it was. But uh, we want to see that happening a number of times and we want to see the population um, you know, at a higher number, obviously, than, uh, than you know, 50 to 60 birds. You know, we, we have been um, in discussions with Montana about what the future looks like if we're, you know, if, if a translocation would be something we want to do again. We're not taking that off the table. Um, our original proposal way back in uh, 2010 
was to do four translocations, and this was actually the fourth one. So uh, we certainly want to give credit to Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and their staff. They've invested a lot of time and effort into this, and the State Game Commission has allowed us to proceed with this project. Um, and uh, yeah, just just really grateful for the cooperation we've received there. And uh, I think both agencies have actually built a lot of skills in their staff through this project as well, because we've had a lot of people involved in, you know, capturing, transmitting, um, moving birds, releasing birds, all those sorts of things. So it, it's very much the fact that you've got a bird that's gone on eight years now does speak to Obviously, it's found the right environment. It's it 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 can thrive in it. Um, it really does become a, a canary in a coal mine situation, doesn't it? In terms of the birds are going to tell you when you've got it right. Yeah, and I, you know, sage grouse being a, a large landscape species as they are, um, they kind of tell you when you've got a functional ecosystem out there. You know, we don't want to lose any pieces of that, and sage grouse are an important. Uh, uh, part of that, you know, the the term umbrella species uh, is used for for those types of of uh, you know sensitive species like sage grouse. If you get it right for them, you've probably covered off the vast majority of the other species on the landscape. And so, we certainly want to keep sage grouse uh, on on the landscape in Alberta, and that's why we're going to such extraordinary. Uh, lengths to do so because they are truly um, critically imperiled and uh, we are you know pulling out stops doing things like translocations to try to keep them here and then uh, buying ourselves some time to work on the habitat at the same time right so so I take it uh, in the coming months it's it's basically a lot of monitoring yes yeah so I've got uh, a couple of uh, dedicated staff members that are checking in on the birds every day and if uh, we think that uh, there's been a mortality they'll go out and try to determine if that's the case right away um, look at the birds movements and determine the nest sites figure out where the nest is not disturbing the bird and then we monitor that bird carefully um, make a rough calculation of when we think she's going to come off her nest and then uh, once she comes off her nest, we go and, and check it and uh, confirm that it was successful, or in some cases it may be depredated, um, and then uh, monitor the young. So yeah, this is, uh, this is what these guys will be doing every day is checking the birds on the computer and then getting out in the field if they need to uh, follow up on them. Well, as they say, uh, this is an ongoing story, Joel, um, one that's probably going to take a number of years. So certainly look forward to getting uh, uh, more updates and, and maybe even another trip down to your part of the world and, and spend some time in the field and, and uh, get some footage of these remarkable birds. Thanks so much for your time yeah. today. You bet. Appreciate it.